Mr. Julie Maston used to sing that song. And boy, bless her heart, I don't think she'd get through it for one to shout. <laughs> but you know, people people don't understand us Pentecostal folk and why we shout and why we carry on the way we do. I'll tell you the problem is they, they just have never had an experience with God. Because when you have an experience with God as real as I've had for 38 years or 35 years, I guess maybe be closer, um, oh, honey, I'll tell you, like Brother... The man who dedicated me as a baby, Brother Warren Tatlock, used to say, just because you shout don't mean you got it. But, baby, when you got it, you've got to shout about it. <laughs> Amen. But when you've got it, you've got to shout about it. Amen. Because it's exciting. It's thrilling. It is something. There, there's such a sense of gratefulness that floods your spirit. And when I think about this song and... Somebody prayed for me. You know, there were years in my life that I was out of church and I was doing all kind of goofy things. Somebody was praying for me. One of the things about this tongue-talking thing that folks don't understand and, and they don't quite get it, but I'll tell you, one thing about this tongue-talking thing is God can use Sister Chong Chai over in China to intercede for me. The Lord can use some lady in Indonesia to pray for me. The Lord can use some fella down in Paraguay somewhere to pray for me. Because when you pray in the Spirit, while you don't know what you're saying, the Bible says that the Spirit itself helps us to pray, and we're praying in accordance to the will of God, and we're able to intercede and pray, and the Lord can put somebody on your heart you don't even know. And you'll just feel such a heavy heart and know somebody needs prayer. Somebody needs somebody to stand in the gap and to, to stand in the hedge and fill in the gap. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I love that song because it has such great significance for me. If you have your Bibles tonight and you'd open them to Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 38. I'm going to try and get through this message with what little bit of time I have. On the tape, that is. Going to talk to us tonight on the topic of the three-day war, standing in honor of the reading of God's Word. Tonight I read from the King James text, Matthew 12, beginning at verse 38, reading through verse 42. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. I'm repeating, I've repeated a portion there. Okay. Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We're so grateful, God, for every opportunity we have to glean something from the word of God that we can take into our lives, God, that is able to better us, that's able to strengthen us, that's able to encourage us. Lord, I have always been painfully aware of the reality that by myself, in myself, of myself, I have nothing to offer God's people. But Lord, I need that anointing which comes from heaven. I need the touch of your hand that rests upon my head. 
and allows me to speak your word boldly and plainly and clearly in love so that the people of God might be receptive and receive it. Master, tonight anoint us, we pray, that we might deliver this word you placed in my heart, and I might do it justice. Help me, God, to deliver it in such a way that fruit will be brought forth unto righteousness in the ears of all hearers, whether they be those in this room or those that might hear on the Internet, those that might receive a tape. God, let each and every life be touched and changed upon the hearing of this message. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Ever since the nation of Israel was established in the late 1940s, following World War II, there have been enemies around her that have sought to squish her out. There have been enemies around her that have desired to uh, remove her from the planet. There are so many tonight that don't want Israel to be a nation. They don't want Israel to have the capability of existing as a nation. In the late 1960s, there was an attack waged against Israel. And it, was, it became a very mighty battle. It became a very fierce battle. It became a very famous battle because it was a very short battle. Because God allowed Israel to have the victory in just six days. And it became known as the Six Day War. They thought they were going to be able to squish Israel right out of existence. But Israel was able to not only hold her own, she was able to win the battle in less than a week. She was able to start the day after one Sabbath and be done before the next Sabbath. Hallelujah. When God's on your side, honey, you've got somebody on your side. Amen. And I can assure you that regardless of how tough and how difficult the circumstance may appear, the reality is you are the winner. I didn't say you can win. I said you are the winner. Amen. Praise God. The disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ faced a great battle as well. And before I get into that, let me say this. Many battles have been named according to the location where they were fought. The Battle of the Bulge, Waterloo, Gettysburg, Normandy. Often the war is named with the number of days in which the battle ensued, particularly if the victory was decisive and glorious and hence the name, the Six-Day War. Now the disciples and followers of Jesus Christ faced a great battle of their own as Satan wrestled with their minds uh, for three full days as to whether or not the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed who he had said he was. Was he able to do what he said he would do? Only God had power over life and death. Listen to me. Only God had power over life and death, and the Lord had declared in John 10, verses 15 through 18, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd." Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. He didn't say anybody else was going to take it up for him. He didn't say, I'm laying down my life, but my Father's going to take it back up for me. Uh-uh. He said, I'm laying down my life, and I will take it up again. He's, and then he goes on to say, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. My Lord, have mercy. Now, listen to this now. In John chapter 19, 9 through 11, And, and they went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer, speaking of Pilate. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all 
against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. For three days the Lord lie in a tomb. You want to talk about dark days. You want to talk about cold days. The disciples had heard the Lord talk about the concept of resurrection. He had told them plainly over and over again that he would rise from the dead. But death has a way of making things feel so final. Death has a way of making the situation go from drastic to hopeless. Because after all, once they're dead, then there, there is no hope. There's nothing more that can be done. And for three days, the, the believers and the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ had to cling to their faith. Do I believe? Can I believe? Can I continue to believe that He is who He said He was? Can I continue to believe that He is capable of doing what He said He could do? Many of us have fought similar battles. Sometimes we wonder, God, are you able? Or God, are you willing? Amen. But I'll tell you, the Lord had plainly told His disciples in Matthew 26, verses 31 and 32, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended of me this night, for it is written, I, am, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, Oh, hallelujah. How much plainer could he tell him? He says, tonight you're all going to leave me. You're all going to abandon me tonight. He said, but after I'm risen again, I'll see you in Galilee. I'll catch up with you over there in Galilee. All right? He's telling them plainly that he's planning on rising from the dead. So then we read in, in Mark chapter 9, verses 8 through 10, And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. This is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they had seen the Lord transfigured with Moses and with Elijah. All of a sudden, they look up, and they saw only Jesus. The Bible says, and as they came down from the mountain, he charged them, listen to this, that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. Well, it means bacon cookies, knucklehead. What do you think? What do you figure it means? But you see, the concept of rising from the dead was so foreign to them, they couldn't even begin to fathom that it was possible for any creature in a human body, even though they looked at this man and realized this has to be God in a human form. This has to be God. What, what kind of man is able to do the things that this man does? Well, what kind of a battle they must have gone through was the glorious vision of a universal church buried with the Lord in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? Or was the risen Savior to be an even greater test of humanity's faith? Was it easier to envision the church happening without the Lord? Or was it easier to believe that with a risen Savior, mankind would believe? The reality is today, friend, we fight our own wars. We have our own battles. Sometimes we're like the disciples sitting and waiting for the Lord to, to rise again. And we're waiting for that miraculous moment when God comes on the scene and rescues us from our situation. And sometimes we wait and we wait and the days seem longer and the nights seem darker. And we sit through that three days until the Lord rises from the dead. But then when that miracle comes and then when we have that miracle and God gives us the miracle and he appears on the scene in spectacular fashion all of a sudden we're faced with a brand new dilemma can we embrace the resurrection it's just as hard to imagine that somebody's risen from the dead as it is 
to believe that somebody's going to rise from the dead. Now, when the Lord had risen from the dead, you know the trouble that some of the disciples had believing it. When the women came from the tomb and told the disciples, they thought the women were just crazy with grief. Because funny enough, God can give us a miracle, the Lord can do something spectacular for us, but the very moment that he ends this three-day battle, a new battle starts. Now can we believe that he is risen? Do you follow me now? We just finished one battle, and baby, we already started the next one. Because now it's a new topic, it's a new subject. We're no longer over here on this battlefield, we're over here on this battlefield. But you're still fighting. Because the reality, my friend, today is our faith will never, ever go without testing. Our faith will never be given a break. You will never have an opportunity to stop and have a breather. This time it's a three-day war. Next time it may be a ten-day war. Next time it may be a six-month war. But you're going to have wars. You're going to have battles. You're going to have struggles. Your faith is going to be tried. Because unfortunately for humanity, no matter how glorious and how wonderful God is, and no matter how miraculous He does things, we still find a way to doubt. We still find a way to question Battles and tests of our faith are part of this journey we call life. If we aren't struggling to believe the Lord will rise again on the third day, then we are wrestling with the notion that the Lord has risen from the dead. One event seeming just as unbelievable and unfathomable as the next. This, then, is why we live faith to faith, the Bible said. Today's three-day war will surrender to tomorrow's war. The good news is that we are not always fighting on the same fronts or defending the same strongholds. Today it is perhaps our confidence in God's ability to provide for us that may be tested. And tomorrow it may be the Lord's ability to heal our bodies that is tested. But remember that Jehovah God has many names by which He is identified. Many names which help us to understand Him better. We have Jehovah Shalom, found in Judges 6, verse 24, which means He is God, our peace. And Jesus showed Himself. Oh, man, I'm going to shout in a minute. He showed Himself to be Jehovah Shalom. When in Mark chapter 4, verses 37 to 39, He was on a ship, and the winds were raging high, and the seas were, were wild, and His disciples were fearful and afraid for their lives. And they woke Him up because He was sleeping. And the Lord came to the bow of that boat and made a declaration, first of all, peace, hallelujah, Jehovah Shalom, I'm the God of peace, glory to God. He said, peace, and then he said, be still, and the seas were calmed, and the storm came to a halt, because our God is a God of peace. And no matter what war we're waging, no matter what fight we're fighting, we have peace in our God, because he is Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. Hallelujah. He's able to call peace into the storms that we face. Glory to God. Amen. He is called in Genesis 22, 14, Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Hallelujah. In Matthew 14, 15 through 21, the Lord is teaching and preaching to 5,000 men plus women and children. They're hungry. There's not much food. He says, feed them. They said, Lord, we don't have but one boy's box lunch is what it amounted to. He said, well, then give it to me. Because when you give God what you got, it'll turn, eat some. Oh, glory. It'll turn into a whole lot more. Amen. 
You give God what you've got, and He is able to make it stretch and do things that you can never make it do. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, Jesus, right there on the fields, on the hillsides of Galilee, became Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Hallelujah. He said, I am able to provide meals for these people. I am able to provide sustenance for these people. They don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to buy anything. Think, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am God, your provider. And mother, tonight, he is your provider. Hallelujah. He's got what you need. He is able tonight to provide. Hallelujah to God. Whoo, glory. I like this next one. <laughs> if I can say it. Jehovah Nisi. He was called... Whoo, glory in Exodus seventeen fifteen. Jehovah our banner. You know what the banner is like this? When you go to battle, you carry your banner. And that identifies who you are. That lets your enemy know who you're fighting for and who you're representing. And God says, I don't just send a flag to represent me. I am the flag. I'm there, hallelujah. When you go into battle, honey, you're holding me up on a pole. Glory to God. And if you look at the way they hang these banners years ago, the way that they would do it is they would do it similar to what you see here, but they'd have a pole that came down the center, and they carried it that way into the battle, and the banner would just wave at the front. Sounds like a cross to me. Hallelujah. Sounds like a cross to me. He says, I'm your banner. Jesus hung on the cross. Woo! Glory. Jesus hung on the cross and said, Jehovah uh, Nisi. Hallelujah. Jehovah, our banner. Glory to God. I'm here blowing in the wind. Uh, but honey, I am the banner that you'll carry into battle. I am the banner that you'll carry into your wars. Glory to God. Just lift up the cross. Hallelujah. Don't put anybody down. Uh, don't preach anybody into hell. Uh, just lift up the cross. Uh, lift up the cross. Uh, lift it up. I, because I am the banner. Glory to God. Woo, glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, the Word of God says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul said it ain't about fancy words, it's about preaching the cross. He said it's not about being able to, to butt heads with wise men who think they know everything. He said it's about preaching the cross. Because in the end, the preaching of the cross can confound the wisest man. It can bring the smartest, most intellectual human being to his knees in tears. Because at the heart of his soul, he knows this is not a story. This is not something written by an author of fiction. This is a reality. This is a fact. Your God went to the cross for you. Oh, hallelujah. Whoo, glory. In Ezekiel 48, 35, my God is called Jehovah Shammah. Huh. Jehovah is there. Where is there? Wherever you need him. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's where he is, wherever you need him. The Bible said the kingdom of God is with men. Where you are, that's where God is. Hallelujah. And where God is, that's where you are. Glory to God. If you look in Matthew 14, 23 through 27, oh, you're going to like this one. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. He was there when they needed him, even if it meant he had to walk on the water to get there. 
<laughs> Mother, no matter what our circumstance, God will be there when you need Him. Because He is not stopped by an ocean. He is not stopped by a sea. He is not stopped by a river. There is not a substance on this planet from water to lava that can block His path. If He needs to get to you, He'll be there because He is Jehovah Shammah. Jehovah is there. And Jesus got where he needed to be because he was Jehovah Shammah. God is there. My people need me. Their boat's about to sink. And they're terrified. And they need me. Let me just get out there and help them. God is there. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, I'm to my last page now. Jeremiah 23 and 6. He is called Jehovah. This one's difficult to pronounce. Sidkenu. This stands for Jehovah, our God, our righteousness. In John chapter 18, verses 33 through 38, we read of the Lord standing before Pilate. And you've heard me talk about this in previous messages. And after Pilate's examination of the Lord and the situation, he turns to the audience of Jews that stood outside crying for the Lord's crucifixion, and he declares, I find no fault in him at all. Hmm. Oh, my. Of course you didn't find any fault, because he was Jehovah, our righteousness. There wasn't anything about him that was not righteous. There wasn't anything about him that wasn't perfect. There wasn't anything about him that wasn't holy. There wasn't anything about him that wasn't absolutely right. And Pilate recognized that as he spoke to the Lord that day and said, I find no fault in him at all. But it's because he was Jehovah, our righteousness, that he was able to go to the cross of Calvary. Because had he not been, if he had not been Jehovah, the sacrifice would have been worthless. And if he had not been righteous, the sacrifice would have been worthless. He had to be both. He had to be both God and he had to be righteous. And he lived the life as a man and he retained his righteousness. He never compromised himself. He never sinned. The Bible sinned. Never sinned. Never, never stepped out of bounds. Interesting. I'll make a little point just as a sideline tonight. He did break the law. According to the law of Moses, the Lord did break the law. He allowed his disciples to pick corn on the Sabbath, remember? He allowed his disciples to eat without washing their hands. Isn't it interesting how that the Lord himself allowed his followers to break the law of Moses. You know why? Because he thought that those standards they had set interpreting the law of Moses were asinine and unrealistic. That if you're hungry, you're hungry. If you're hungry, you're hungry. You're going to go ahead. If you're out in the field working, you ain't going to run two miles to a well to wash your hands so you can eat. You're just going to pick something and start eating. See, God is not as unrealistic as we think. And the standards that he would set for us are not as asinine and as ridiculous as many churches would have you to believe. Because the reality is he knows when something is flat out practical and when something is flat out foolish. Amen. I want you to know tonight that he is Jehovah, our righteousness. And guess what? In Numbers 13 and 6... He's called Joshua, which is a derivative of Jehovah. And it means Jehovah, our Savior. In Acts 7 and 45 and Hebrews 4 and 8, you find that Jesus Christ is called Joshua, Jehovah, our Savior. Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. And in all reality tonight, if you were to speak in Hebrew, you would actually say Yeshua, 
That's his actual name in the Hebrew would be Yeshua. But I want you to know tonight, he was called Jehovah our Savior. But listen to this now. Titus makes it clear who this Jesus was. He says in Titus 1, 3, and 4, But God hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, even the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, Tommy, which one is it? There are two saviors. So obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ and God are one. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want you to understand today that uh, Jesus Christ is all of the things that I've described tonight. He is all of these things in one physical form. He is our all-sufficiency. He is our all in all. Colossians 2, 6 through 10 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Tonight you can win, we can win every battle, regardless of what battlefield we fight on, because the Lord Jesus Christ is our peace, the Lord Jesus Christ is our provider, the Lord Jesus Christ is our banner, the Lord Jesus Christ is presence, hallelujah, the Lord is our righteousness, and the Lord is our Savior, glory to God, amen. Second Chronicles 20:17. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, set, stand still. Just hold your ground. In Ephesians 6, 13 and 14, the Word of God tells us, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Hallelujah. Having done all, one, two, stand. Amen. There are times you may not move forward. There are times you may not be able to make any headway or gain any ground. But the Lord said, that's all right, one. Just stand. Don't let the enemy move your foot. One step backward, glory to God. Just stand and hold your ground, glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, the Word of God tells us, Let not your heart be troubled, the Lord said. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? But Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. See, when you read it in context, all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense. Philip's asking him, how do I get where you're going to be? I'm sorry, Thomas says to him, how, how can we get, you know, to where you're going to be? And the Lord says, Thomas, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. My Buddhist friend, I got news for you. I hope you enjoy your religion. I hope it's good to you. I hope it does a lot of positive things for your your health and well-being, but you better come and face Jesus because you'll never find God without him. The only way you're going to find 
the Lord God Jehovah is to look into the face of the man Jesus Christ. That's what my Bible tells me. Amen. All we need to do sometimes, Juan, is stand. We don't always have to make headway. We don't always have to move forward. It's nice when we can. But if the enemy is barraging you, sometimes I think people discourage themselves because they're not making headway. They're not gaining ground. It'd be easy for me to get discouraged and say, well, our church isn't growing. We're not getting any more people, so I'm not going to do this anymore. But you know what? We've got a few people that I feel responsible for, and I feel like that God's placed them in my care, and I'm supposed to preach and take care of them. So, baby, i got to just stand. I don't care if I'm making headway or not. I don't care if we're growing or not. I've got to stand. I've just got to keep doing what I'm doing. If all I do is stand in the same spot and do it. Amen. And then Peter, in 2 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter writes, A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, even our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he is Jehovah, our righteousness. Amen. So today... You may be facing a three-day battle, just like the apostles faced three days, waiting for the Lord to rise. But little did they realize that that battle was only going to be met with another battle immediately following. Because once he rose, then the battle became, well, is he really alive again? <laughs> Should I really believe he rose from the dead? Maybe I was just seeing something. Maybe I was just hallucinating. Amen. You know... I love people, I'm closing with this, I love people who say, if only they could see some great miracle or something, they believe God. I had a friend that told me that one time. I used to talk to him about miracles and how God was a healer and all this. And He said, Charles, I love you, you're a great guy, but I'll never come to your church. I said, well, that's all right, nobody's going to force you to come to church. And I've told you all the story, I'm not going to repeat the whole story. But when he called me about his friend, Teresa, who was in a hospital dying with AIDS, and they had given her about 24 hours to live, and I went to the hospital, and I anointed that girl with oil and prayed for her. And that was on a Sunday. And then on Tuesday, I went back. I gave Monday, because I figured let her visit with her family and everything. I went back on Tuesday, and she was sitting up in a chair, eating all of the tubes that had been pulled out of her body. Now, honey, I've been in that situation. And I'm going to tell you, something miraculous has to happen. And her doctor said, I don't have a clue what's going on. He said, I cannot even begin to tell you what's happening with this girl. He said, all I know is if she can get her strength back up, he said, by Friday she can go home. Friday she went home. Called me a month or so later, said, Brother Marl, my viral load is undetectable. They can't find the virus in my body. She said, my T cells are at normal levels. The doctor said, this is impossible. This don't even happen with medication. I said, honey, you didn't treat it with medication. You treated it with Jesus. You didn't treat it with medication. When you treat it with Jesus, strange and unusual things happen. Miraculous things happen. And my friend saw this miracle happen. And he said to me, but right after it happened, matter of fact, right after I prayed for her, he said to me, while you were praying, he said, I felt like a presence walked into the room. He said, I could just feel this powerful presence walk into the room. I said, you felt King Jesus coming on the scene <laughs> with, with a balm. There is a balm in Gilead, and it's to heal the nations. I said, and he brought that balm to heal that girl. I said, that's what you felt. He said, I've never felt anything like that in my life. He said, I just had chills all up and down my body. And then he saw that girl the next morning wake up like nothing had ever happened, just completely, immediately changed and healed and asking for food when she hadn't eaten in weeks and they had been feeding her intravenously. And all of a sudden she said, can somebody get me food? I need some food. And she started eating. So, friend, I'm going to tell you, this friend of mine says, I, he said, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I would have never believed it. He said, I, I just never would have believed it. You know what? It wasn't a month later I bumped into him. 
we were talking, and I said to him, so how's Teresa? He said, well, she's good. She's down in Texas with her family, and blah, 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 and, you know, she's doing real good and everything. And, and uh, I said, man, God sure gave her a wonderful miracle. And he said, well, you know, it could have been that the treatments they were given are kind of finally kicked in, and it could have been that suddenly it decided to work, and it could have been. See, people who look for a sign, you remember how we started this message tonight? They're asking for a sign. People who look for a sign wouldn't be satisfied when they got it because they'll explain it away when it happens. Even if at first they acknowledge it, they'll still wind up thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and try to come up with every reason for why it wasn't what they thought it was. Amen. But I'm going to tell you tonight that God does some wonderful, miraculous things. Amen. And when he does, when God comes to the rescue, without fail, be prepared and know if your three-day war ends today, you're just going to start a new one tomorrow. Amen. Be aware of that. That's how it works. It's how it happens. Don't think you're going to get a break. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But if we can just remember, if we can just remember what God has done, I mean, not just rising from the dead and all that, but if you can remember what God's done for you in the past and how the Lord's come through, instead of, because I think we forget about it, just like the children of Israel in the wilderness, we forget what God has done for us in the past. And we wind up crabbing and complaining like God ain't doing nothing. And we're forgetting, honey, no, the Lord's always come through for you. Like that little song they sang this afternoon, the Lord will come through somehow. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. Glory, glory, glory. He is our banner. That, that's one that I really like. <laughs> that was one that I really, really liked. Master, we love you, God. We thank you for this service. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for this word of encouragement. God, let it just find a deep, deep place in every heart that we might be encouraged to understand you as Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, uh, Jehovah Shema, all these things, Lord, that you are. You are our peace. You are our righteousness. You are our Savior. You are our uh, ever-present ever-present God. And you are our banner, God. When we go to battle, you are right there with us as we lift up the cross. Master, in the name of Jesus tonight, God, help this word to encourage us as we go home. Bless the fellowship, the time we spend together tonight. Let everything that's said and done be to the glory of Christ our King. For we ask it in Jesus' name.